In this video, we are going to talk about criterion reference tests and how to construct them. Criterion reference tests measure student achievement against specified curriculum objectives. They're used for achievement measurement, remediation, and evaluation of the instructional program. These are the most commonly administered teacher-created summative assessments in the classroom. There are some very specific steps involved in constructing a valid criterion reference test. Specifically, we seek to identify the main terminal skills, identify specific directions and response requirements, develop specific test items, define each skill to be tested, divide material into tracks, and then set, select the content for test items. To identify terminal skills, you look at the major concept skills or knowledge you expect the students to acquire during instruction. The student should be able to perform in any of these areas or complete any of these skill requirements. When developing directions, you want to identify what form or procedure will be used to demonstrate that a student has mastered objective. Look at your vocabulary. How are the student's responses to be made? And in each case, we should structure the test in a manner as to relate it as closely to possible to the content of the instructional program, using the same vocabulary that was used in teaching and responding in the same manner that students used during the course of the instructional program. As you develop specific test items, the things to keep in mind is will it be true, false, multiple choice, or some combination to assess a specific skill. And as you make that decision, you want to consider the strengths and weaknesses of each one of these alternatives. Specific cognitive skills are better tested by some formats than others. In defining the skill to be tested, if you have a teacher's guide that has a scope and sequence chart, Use that to determine the skill to be tested, such as your SOL scope and sequence in Virginia. If no scope and sequence exist, work backwards through the program to find the essential skills. Usually in material that's highly sequential in nature, most of the skills will be present in the last few pages of the chapter or unit. In other areas, such as social studies, literature, etc., you may have to simply scan the material to determine the main concepts to be tested. You don't want to divide your test into tracks, and tracks are ways of clustering your, your items so that they look at a specific set of skills that are related to each other. For example, in a math test, you might want to have a section on addition, and then have a track on subtraction and then track on multiplication. And if you do those sorts of things, it's going to allow you sort of to cluster those and see these results. And organizing it helps you to determine real quickly any areas of weaknesses that your students may have or that may any gaps that may be in the instructional program. Okay, some guidelines about test items. Don't test trivia. Uh, include items that are re relevant to the amount of time that you spent. Uh, for ins instance, if you spend twice as much time on um, a concept A as you do on concept B, you should have twice as many items on A than you have on B. And then you want to consider if a content can be assessed using uh, representative cases or if it has to be individually assessed. And when I talk about representative cases, let's consider uh, mathematics again. Uh, you only need perhaps 10 items to determine if a student can divide two digit numbers into three digit numbers. If they can do that 10 times correctly uh, with different examples, that's pretty representative of their skill. On the other hand, in a subject such as history, one particular response, you may have to have lots of multiple types of approaches uh, because a student does not necessarily, knowledge of one item does not necessarily relate to knowledge of the other. A uh, student uh, simply knowing um, that General Lee was the uh, Confederate general and the, uh, that Grant was a Union general is um, 
not going to be able, that's not enough to represent if this, the skill you're looking for is identify uh, the key generals multiple, for instance. So you can't just ask one or two questions. You have to look at those very specifically if there is a specific list of items that are important. Okay, now with the availability of computer-based assessments and gamification, there's a lot of different ways you can assess students and types of questions, things that we couldn't do before. Hotspot questions, drag and drop, select many or none. Uh, while all these sorts of questions are new, they're basically variants on the big seven question types. And those are short answer, multiple choice, true and false, matching, essay, oral, and computation. The last two we're not going to talk about much in here because they're pretty self-explanatory. Oral is simply directly asking the student and listing for their response. Uh, mostly common in oral exams that you would find in higher education or in graduate programs, you will see it. And sometimes in some high schools, you will see something similar. Um, and then computational questions are just that. For instance, math, class, math questions multiply four times six. Uh, so we're not going to really discuss those in any great detail um, here in the next coming week, but I want to talk about the first five. Okay, completion uh, and short answer questions, for the, for the most part, they're the same, they're equivalent. Uh, they just look different. A completion item consists of a sentence with one or more blanks, the students are expected to identify the word or short phrase being represented by each blank. But virtually any completion item can be rewritten as an equivalent short answer item and vice versa. And short answer items are relatively easy to write. Short answer uh, and completion items are easy to construct. Uh, they require students to supply the answer. Uh, rather than having them pick the answer. And a substantial number of short answer and completion items can be incorporated into a test uh, without uh, taxing sort of time constraints. Now there's some limitations too. Basically, it's restricted to recall of information. These are the lower level thinking skills, but it's a great way to assess if they just have that base uh, information and, and understanding knowledge level. Uh, short answer and completion items uh, can be scored erroneously uh, relatively easily. Um, and then uh, these items take, take more time to score. And um, uh, there are some uh, computerized means for using these, but sometimes they don't auto score it real well or they're so restrictive that a student who enters an incorrect character in terms of a typo or maybe uses an alternative spelling uh, will not be recognized for having actually answered the question correctly. Okay, some basic guidelines. Uh, work backwards, uh, jot the answer that you want, then write a direct question that will get to that answer. Avoid using sentences right out of the book because you don't want the students just to memorize the book. Um, with completion items, generally avoid having more than one blank per sentence. Uh, uh, and if the blank is placed near the end of the sentence rather than at the beginning, it helps with just sort of clarification and it's easier for the students to read and supply the answers. With completion items, omit words and don't omit so many words that the sentence is lost. Uh, be sure that the answer is factually correct. Uh, and then the big piece on all of these is make sure that the reading level is at the level of the student's ability. Um, it's been said that all tests are reading comprehension tests. So uh, if you're uh, in a history course, for instance, make sure that uh, the excerpts they read and those sorts of pieces that they put together uh, are at the level the students currently are. Okay, multiple choice. What can I say about multiple choice that you have not already experienced? It's the most common question. Uh, it's been used in public schools from, at this point, primary grades through graduate school. Um, it's really kind of nice, 
because everybody's familiar with it. Uh, it's better than true false items because you don't really have the same opportunity for guessing. Um, a multiple choice item usually consists of a stem and a problem and a series of alternatives, each representing possible answers to that stem. But normally, only one option is correct, with the remaining alternatives referred to as distractors. Normally, as it has been practiced many, many over many, many years, it was uh, many bubbles, choose one. Uh, now we do have computer assisted testing that allows to have multiple sorts of responses uh, as well. And that's a very useful piece to have. Okay, some advantages, uh, it allows for a pretty adequate sampling of content. Um, you can go through and structure the problems to be addressed pretty effectively. Um, and they can be scored very efficiently. Uh, it's a very objective sort of measure to have. Multiple choice items are can be susceptible to guessing, um, and you can measure much higher cognitive levels, but it's pretty difficult to construct those. Typically, you're working at the at the knowledge comprehension um, level here. And it's a little difficult to get to synthesis and creative acts. So, okay, some big pieces basically in constructing them. Avoid trivia. Put your important information in the stem, uh, and then make sure that your responses are precise. Uh, make the distractors plausible. Uh, avoid trick questions, although that happens accidentally more than one time. I have done that to, to a group, and I used to, in this course, um, have a specific question on a first exam just to, just to explore um, how that frustration level is. But that frustration level was so high for teachers that it was in my best interest to take that piece out. I always came back and rescored it and gave them credit for it. But my, my point was I wanted to show how you handle when you write a bad question, those sorts of things. So um, avoid grammatical clues. Uh, make sure there's only one correct response very clearly. Uh, sometimes, if that's what you're seeking, sometimes um, there can be some choices where there's some ambiguity. This format does require you to remove ambiguity from the assessment. Um, keep the alternatives similar in their tone and their length and their structure so that one doesn't sort of pop out. Uh, typically, longer, um, longer responses tend to be the correct responses, strangely enough. Um, and then avoid absolutes, uh, the never, always, those sorts of pieces. Similar to that, uh, avoid using statements such as both A and C or B and D. Um, they can be pretty confuse, confusing. And also all of the above, none of the above. Um, use them sparingly um, because, again, it becomes sort of a, a logic problem. And if you're teaching logic, then that's the place for it. But if you're teaching another content, you, you want to test your content. Align a level with where the students are, the reading level. Clearly state the problem to be addressed. Avoid extraneous information. Avoid neg double negatives. Or please don't not avoid using double negatives. Uh, distribute correct responses using A, B, C, and D and include items that will draw on those higher levels. I mentioned that just a moment ago. Uh, they can be developed for comprehension, uh, application analysis. It's, uh, and um, you have to primarily use, in that case, uh, some, some situation graphs, maps, and charts to be interpreted in those sorts of pieces, uh, or specific operations they'd have to complete in order to choose the correct answer. One last uh, really benefit of uh, multiple choice questions that we don't talk about uh, much is the value of really good distractors. Uh, and not just plausible, but look for those common 
misperceptions. Uh, to think of one, let's say uh, in earth science at the fourth grade level, uh, why is it hotter in summer than winter? Uh, you know, the, the immediate distractor is going to be because the Earth's closer to the sun. Um, that's a great answer. It's wrong, but it's a great answer. Um, so what uh, you can find out in this, though, if you use good alternatives, um, is not only they, what they don't know, but what their thinking process is sometimes because you know how they arrived at that particular response. Uh, and the other piece too, it tells you, you, you really get two pieces of data when a student answers a question wrong. You know they don't know the content they responded to, and you know they don't know the content that they chose as an answer. So if your choices are red, blue, green, and yellow, the right answer is green, they chose red, well, the problem that comes about then is that not only do they not know red, but they don't know green. Uh, a clever strategy to use if you want to build some uh, retake options in there is you know they don't know green, so give them feedback on the green on that question. Don't tell them the right answer, but say, no, it's not green because. Just an idea and a suggestion. Okay, true false items are really popular because you can write them really quick but sometimes they're not actually that well written. Um, the problem is they kind of require an absolute standard of truth. It's true, it's false, it has to be declarative to a point where it's clearly one or the other. Um, sometimes a um, statement you think is obviously true may be for the students who experience, have different experiences, may not read that statement and interpret it exactly in the same way that you do. So be careful about that. Um, so uh, that's the, the sort of the first piece here. Some of the advantages, uh, my favorite and most important one is that you can uh, develop a very full sampling of content because you can do a lot of multiple choice items just to get a real quick snapshot of what they know, don't know, all the way through. Uh, true, false are relatively easy to construct. Uh, they're effectively scored, uh, efficiently, effectively scored. Uh, some of the limitations, they are susceptible to guessing. They do require you to have a true, false sort of um, content, something that can be measured that way. Um, and uh, they can't really um, measure higher level processing or thinking. It's primarily at that knowledge level that you're, um, that you're going to be questioning students there. But it does provide a really, really quick snapshot. For instance, if you can wrap up a lecture with a quick true false quiz on the content you just did and you you can do that with 40 items scan down check and when you get those back you're going to have tremendous feedback on how effectively you communicated what you wanted to in terms of their ability to at least know what you've said that processing and understanding will come but first they have to know it Okay, matching items. Uh, it's a list of descriptions and a list of options. Make sure that if you have distractors in your lips, they're plausible. Descriptions should be longer items uh, than, the, than the options. And then it's pretty wise to either include more options than descriptions or to use some of the options more than once. That helps eliminate students solving by basis of elimination. Uh, then uh, specify in your directions a basis for matching, and then make sure the reading levels line up. Uh, if we do all those things, you're going to have really strong items that you should be able to um, pull together. Essay items are one of the most flexible test formats. It can measure any skill that you could assess with any other test format. An essay item is uniquely able to assess a student's ability to organize their ideas and communicate them in writing. My favorite thing about this, again, is it's an item 
that requires the student to provide the answer. The answer is not somewhere on that page for them to find, but it's for them to demonstrate everything. And this is where we get into higher level uh, thinking skills. Um, and this tends to be my preference. Uh, I think sometimes we get hung up on the notion that essays are always formal. But if you look back through this course, this course consists of basically nothing but essay assessments. Your, the process of you going through and organizing your thoughts and cutting them down is the most important part of what we're doing this term, uh, helping you sort of bring together and solidify all your thoughts on the topic here. Some of the advantages of essay items is that they can examine the student's ability to communicate in writing. They require students to supply the response. If they're well written, they can easily measure those higher levels of cognitive functioning. The limitations they usually produce a less adequate sampling of content. That is, you're getting a lot of depth here, but not as much coverage as you could with some other items. Uh, scoring is less reliable because it is not entirely objective. Uh, they're more time consuming. And then you have to uh, consider time as a factor always um, in any of this here. If, when you construct tests that um, are compressed in time, sometimes we are measuring not how well or depth of understanding um, uh, students have, but we are measuring their ability to take that test. Okay, some uh, guidelines. Make sure it's to the specified skill that you know what that skill understanding knowledge is that you want to assess. Make sure that you line your essay question up to that. Make sure there's plenty of time. Uh, reading skills should be at the level just slightly below of students in the class um, so that you make sure they have it. Um, make sure that uh, you have a uh, scoring plan and make sure that scoring plan is aligned with what experts would say would be a good fair scoring system for your particular essay. And uh, then make that scoring plan very, very clear to the students. Um, and this is the case, for instance, with the uh, philosophy of grading um, paper. I asked you to submit in several forms, actually, um, and took a long time for you to um, sort of process and bring together all these different viewpoints and sort of summarize them and, and, ad and adapt them. But uh, within that submission, requiring you to assess your own using the same instrument I am going to, that will always, always strengthen your students' responses and thought processes. That wraps up all the major pieces I wanted to hit, and I want to keep this under um, half an hour, so um, I'm pleased to have done that. Um, I'll be uh, back again with uh, some additional lectures coming up. So uh, thank you very much for your participation in class. I continue to look forward to uh, reading your submissions and the work that you do.